welcome again, it's Angela Thornton with Wise Words Ministries. Welcome, it's day four of our journey through the Psalms in 31 days. We are going right into our recap of day three. Our reading for today, just in case you have not yet read and you've lost your calendar, you will be reading Psalm 4, 64, 94, and 124. Did I miss one? I'm sorry, Psalm 4, 34. 64, 94, and 124. But right now, we're going to get into a recap of yesterday's reading, which was, of course, day three. And we read Psalm 3, 33, 63, 93, and 123. Let's take a quick look at Psalm 4, the theme of which the faithful are safe in the Lord. It is a Psalm of David. And he's talking about how faithful God is to those who love him. And like many, uh, this reading, it deals with God hearing us and answering our cry. Whereas in Psalm 3, David was in physical danger. He was running from his son, Absalom, who was attempting to overthrow him and kill him. My God, your own child wants to kill you. But he acknowledges that God has heard him. And that God has relieved him of this distress. Yet now he is troubled by the sin of the people. And so when we look at a couple of the verses, it tells us that David recognizes that living a righteous life is a sacrifice. But it must be done if we're going to wholly trust and serve God. And also in here, we see the word Selah for the second time. And again, that word is something we do not something we say. But let's get back to this sacrifice of righteous living. What the Lord said to me as I was reading that is that yes, righteous living and holy living is a sacrifice. Unlike sin, when we were living in sin, not only was it not a sacrifice, it was easy. And for most of us, it was fun. Which is why if you want to live holy, you have to sacrifice because what you fuel your spirit and feed it, your flesh will respond. So if you fuel your spirit with righteousness and holiness, your flesh will follow. Likewise, if you fuel your spirit with junk, your flesh will follow with junk, also known as sin. And then let's move over to Psalm 34. This is where we may spend a little more time. So if I go beyond my 10 minutes that have been prescribed to me, it's going to be okay today. Psalm 34 is really a commentary about a poor man's rich legacy and his total trust in God. David wrote this one also. Verses one and two definitively tell us what the psalmist will do. He says, I will bless the Lord. I will praise the Lord and I will boast in him. Five times we're told in this psalm that David sought the Lord, cried out to the Lord, and not only did the Lord hear him, but he answered him, which in and of itself is really a great, great blessing to seek the Lord and know that he hears you. David also says that they looked to him and they were radiant and that this poor man cried out. I love verse seven because it says that the angel of the Lord encamps around those. It is present tense. He's encamping now, not that he will, not that he did, but that he currently is. I love verse eight because it says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. He is good. It is present tense. It's not that he was good or he's going to be good, that he is good right now. You need only taste and see. And then when we look at verses 11 through 14 of Psalm 34, what we really find here is, there is no good thing that shall be denied those whose first and only thought is of the Lord. Well, maybe not your only thought, but there is no good thing will be denied to those who love God, who seek after him in righteousness, who are offering up a sacrifice of righteousness and a sacrifice of holy living. And then verses 15 through 18, here is, he says, the eyes of the Lord are toward who? the righteous. And we see this word again, the righteous. 
and his ears are open to their cry. So if you are one of the righteous, his eyes are toward you and his ears are open to you. He inclines his ear to those who claim him as father, as Lord, as savior. Likewise, the scripture tells us he turns a deaf ear to those who do not claim him. So if you do not claim him, if you are not living righteously, if you are not seeking after him, he has no obligation to hear you, to listen to you, or to answer you. And then verses 19 through 22, really what they say to us is that no weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. Because verse 19 says what? Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him. Not he will deliver, not he is going to deliver, but he delivers him from them all. So even in the midst of your affliction, he is yet delivering you because it says the Lord delivers him from this all, all from all of them. So yes, the afflictions are coming. Yes, the trials are coming. Yes, there will be many because it says many of the afflictions, but it promises that he will deliver you, not from some, not from a few, but from them all. And it reminds me of what Isaiah says, no weapon formed against you shall be able to prosper. And every tongue that rises against you, you will be able to condemn. I bless God for that. And so as we look at this last verse, only those who truly serve God shall be redeemed. So if you are not serving him, you cannot expect his redemption, which means hell just might be your portion. And then we move to Psalm 64. This is a Psalm where we see God as a defender, again, of what? The righteous. Psalm 64 is also called a lament or a complaint Psalm. And quite a few of the Psalms, if you, as you're reading with us, you will find have some sort of lament or some sort of complaint. Verses one through six are the complaint, but it also tells us that life and death is in your hand. When we look at verses five and six, they say, hold fast to themselves. They hold fast to themselves an evil purpose. They talk of laying snares. They say, who can see them? I want you to know your enemy might be wondering who can see them, but you serve a God who is omniscient. He knows all things about all people and every other thing. He is omnipresent. He is everywhere at all times. There is nowhere that he is not. So while you may not see them and you may not know, God can see them and God knows. And then verse six says, they, they have a well-conceived plot. I need you to know it's okay for the inward thought and heart of the man are deep. What that says to me is, what Proverbs tells us, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And while they their plot may be well conceived, I serve a God, I promise you, he's the God of all flesh, even the flesh of the one whose plot is well conceived, because I have victory. Victory is mine, saith the Lord. And then when we look at the rest of this psalm, it says, and they will declare the work of the Lord and he will consider what he has done. You see, now we start declaring what God has done because we trust him. We have confidence in him that there is no weapon formed against us that will prosper. There is no plot. There is no plan. There is no scheme. There is no orchestration. There is no machination that the enemy can come up against us with that the Lord will not deliver me from. And then we move over to Psalm 94. It too is a lament or complaint. In this Psalm, the prophet calls for justice. This is a Psalm which has no known author. So we don't know who wrote it. It is assumed though for many theologians that a prophet wrote it, but he's calling for justice and he complains of tyranny. He complains of sinfulness in the land. So verses one through seven, he asks God, how long God? How long shall the wicked be allowed to win? Have you ever been in a situation where you really just said, God, how long? How long do I have to suffer? How long does it appear that the uncircumcised Philistines are doing just fine? How long are they winning? How long before you bring judgment against them? That's what he was asking. How long, God? How long? 
They are pouring forth their words. They're speaking arrogantly. They act as if they don't know you and you don't matter. How long are you going to allow this to go on? And then verse eight, he says, please pay heed to the senseless among the people. Then he says, he who planted an ear, does he not hear? Does he not see? Again, God sees everything. We may not see, we may not know, but he will move in his time. But I love verses 11 and 12. It said, the Lord knows the thoughts of man. They are a mere breath. All that we know comes from God. He knows everything. And the little that we can think does not begin to compare to all that God knows. Because our ways are not his ways and our thoughts are not his thoughts. He knows everything. And then verse 12 blessed me. It says, blessed is the man whom you chasten, O Lord. Now, I know nobody really wants a spanking. When I was a kid, I didn't get spankings. I got a whooping. Nobody wanted those. We didn't want to be chastened. But it did me good. And what God says to me is, it's better to be chastened and live than it is to be left alone and die. You see, his chastening brings life to you. So allow the Lord to chasten you. Allow him to remove everything in you that's not of him so that you may live, that you may have life and have life more abundantly, lest you be left alone and you be a walking dead. And then finally end up with Psalm 124. And again, it's discussing the Lord defending his people. This too is a song of accents or a song of degrees. It's also known as a Psalm of Thanksgiving. Because herein we find the church blesses the Lord for his miraculous deliverance. Look at what the verse says. Had it not been for the Lord who was on our side, let Israel say, had it not been the Lord who was on our side, when men rose up against us, then they would have swallowed us up. It's three things they said. Then they would have engulfed us. They would have swept over our soul. So what that says to me is that without God, on our side, without God as our banner, we become easy prey for the enemy. I'm thinking of the song that Helen Baylor sang in Old Wood That I Could Sing. If it had not been for the Lord on my side, tell me where would I be? Help me, Jesus, where would I be? So I want you to know that the Lord is on your side. And this Psalm ends with the prophet saying, Blessed be the Lord who has not given us to be torn by their teeth. So never forget where your help and your strength come from. And no matter what has happened to you, no matter what has happened, listen to what the psalmist says. The snare is broken and we have escaped. The snare is broken. Even if they caught you, they can't keep you because the snare is broken and you have escaped because your help is in the name of the Lord. If you can't think enough to pray, just call on the name of the Lord because therein lies your help and the snare is broken. And the name of the Lord is the same Lord who made heaven and earth. He keeps us and he sustains us. God bless you until we meet on tomorrow for day five. Our reading will be Psalm 5, 35, 65, 95, and 125. Until we meet again, remember the snare is broken and your help is in the name of the Lord.